Well, welcome everyone today. Thank you. How's your month been? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> been different for different people, obviously. Uh, Mind and Mary's has been very intense, and uh, and we've had some really big things to deal with. So many of you would maybe have sent me some emails that you've got no response to. And the reason why is because we've had very little chance to do anything else other than process our emotions for the month. And uh, today, actually, I'm in a terrible state, so I don't know what kind of a, <laughs> a discussion you're going to get today. Because this morning I had an emotion come up of just wanting to die, so, um, so we'll see how we go with that <laughs> today. Um, so I've been, uh, pro I've processed that quite a lot through my life, and uh, um, when I was young, when I was about six years of age, and again when I was about nine, I had pneumonia. And for any of you who've had pneumonia, it's actually a desire to die through sadness. Which uh, I'm getting the symptoms of again, so we'll just see how we go with that. So I've got to work through that emotion for myself. And Mary's obviously having different emotions to work through, and she's been doing really well as well. She's actually at the moment out printing out some more handouts for you, for those of you who haven't got a handout. But today the discussion is about prayer, and I wanted to have this series of discussions now, not just today, but from for the next few discussions, are going to be about our relationship with God. And the reason why I wanted to deal with that specifically is I feel we've had a lot of discussion up to now about the law of attraction. We've had a lot of discussion up to now about you know, opening up emotionally and dealing with your emotions. And now I feel that the majority of us are sort of ready to start really connecting with God and being aware of how that connection is an emotional connection. And so that's why I wanted to really focus now on the specific things to do with your relationship with God. And the very first of those things is prayer, obviously. So we want to talk about what prayer is. So this is not going to be a very religious discussion, by the way. So those of you who are a bit afraid that it might be a religious discussion, it won't be. It'll be more a discussion about how you interact with God and how God interacts with you. So we'll talk about that a lot throughout this session today. What we want to do too um, is maybe read a few things. Uh, ideally, what I would have liked to have done if I was more prepared is that we would have liked to get a few people up here and actually there's an excerpt I want to read from the Life Elysium and it's all got different characters. So you're going to have to put your imagination on when I read through that and imagine me in all these different roles as I'm reading out the, uh, the excerpt because it's going to help you look at the issue of what is involved in prayer. So we want to uh, look specifically at that. Now, do all of you have, uh, do you all have a handout? Okay. It's uh, four pages long, and, and there is another handout that I'll be emailing out with it, which is actually an excerpt that I'll be talking about today from the book, The Life Elysium. And that's eight pages long, but you'll actually, oh, maybe nine pages long, nine pages long, and that I'll send via email to, to you, so, so you'll get that sometime in the future. Um, how many of, tomorrow, of course, there's a mediumship session tomorrow, so... For those of you who are coming along to that, uh, we'll be looking at the mediumship issue, the second session of the mediumship stuff, tomorrow, not today. All right. It was funny today because I had this feeling that uh, I was just in a total blank. And I often come to these sessions in a total blank, so <laughs> I hope that doesn't uh, <laughs> worry you too much, but today I'm really in a total blank, so we'll see how we go uh, about dealing with the discussion. Unfortunately, I'm in a total blank about my favourite subject, which is, which is prayer, so, um, so I'm finding that it's a bit difficult, <laughs> um, because normally uh, I would feel uh, a lot of very, very deep emotions about it, and today, because I'm in this other emotion, it's very, very difficult for me to connect. So you'll have to bear with me today, and I don't mind if you get up and walk out and say, oh, AJ just was not on song today. <laughs> <laughs> now, you remember what your soul is. What is your soul? Here's your soul. What is it? Emotions. Your emotions. Desires. 
Is it memories? Somebody mentioned food? Passions? Desires? Intentions? Experiences? Aspirations, somebody mentioned? And so forth, right? So there's our soul. That's a soul is the real you. So, the mind is not the real you. Your brain is not the real you. The soul is the real you. This is something that we've said over and over and over again. Those who don't have a hand out, would you like to just put your hand up so that Mary can just hand them out to you? So, this is the real you. The real you needs to connect to the real God. So what, what is God? God is a soul as well. You could say God is the great oversoul, if you like. Remember, we always say that God has divine love and divine truth are the primary characteristics of the soul. And that probably just means that, isn't it? So that's something we need to bear in mind. But God's soul has attributes and qualities. Very, very similar, in fact, attributes and qualities to our own soul, but far more infinite in capacity. The reason why is because we, our soul, was created in God's image. So, so the qualities and attributes that exist in our soul exist in God's soul, but to a far more powerful degree. And in fact, in fact to an infinite degree. So there's God's soul, there's our soul. How do the, those two souls talk? Well, the only way they're going to be able to talk is soul to soul. Now, if we, if our soul is our emotions, our passions, our desires, our intentions, and so forth, then wouldn't it make sense then that the way we talk to God is through those things? Can you see that? The way we actually speak with God is through those things. It's not actually the words that we speak. It's not actually the thoughts that we have but it's actually the emotions and the feelings that are within us that we direct to God, that God hears. So if we term, use the term hearing in terms of God's hearing our prayer and hearing in the sense of our hearing God's response, the hearing will all occur at the soul level. Does that make sense to everyone? All prayer is a soul-to-soul -soul connection. A soul-to-soul -soul connection, your soul connecting with God's soul. Now, obviously, when you connect to your own soul, usually you connect to it emotionally. When you connect to other people, generally you connect with them emotionally. So it's the same with your connection with God. It's to do with your emotional connection, your passion connection, your desire connection, your intentions and all those things. All of those things are your connection with God. So obviously, if I don't develop myself emotionally, if I don't deserve to develop my desires and passions, obviously I'm going to have a lower capacity to connect to God than if I develop all of those things. And that's why, all through up till now, we've spoken a lot about emotions and a lot about passion, a lot about desire, because these are the ways in which we connect to God. So our soul having a longing for God connects God with our soul through this thing that I've used, the term Holy Spirit. Now, this is not some, some religious type of connotation. It's an actual physical energy force that God uses from God's soul to our soul. And it's like a pipeline through which communication occurs. And in, in, in specifically, this Holy Spirit is the pipeline, if you like, or the conduit, for divine love to flow between the two souls. So remember we've spoken about that before in, in some of the other sessions that we've had. <coughs> so the Holy Spirit, and the reason why it's called the Holy Spirit by celestial spirits is because it's the one spirit of God or the one attribute of God that is specifically for the transmission of divine love from God's soul into your soul. Now God can also transmit other emotions and feelings and energies into your soul through other methods. God has a creative energy, for example. Your life breath or your life force is a part of that creative energy. That's an energy that God gives to all living things. But that's not what I'm talking about here. 
This is a specific energy, the Holy Spirit. The, you can think of it as the greatest energy God has in terms of influencing your soul. And it's the pipeline or the connection between God's soul and your soul. Now, once that connection is made, then divine love can throw, flow through the connection. Now, next week in Brisbane, we'll be having a talk about prayers for divine love. And we'll be concentrating specifically on what maintains the connection between yourself and God through the Holy Spirit with regard to uh, receiving divine love. So that's next week. Today, what we're doing is talking more generally about prayer itself and what kind of prayers God can hear from you and what kind of prayers God can't hear from you. <coughs> or we should more specifically say, cannot due to the laws involved that God has created. So, can we see our focus, our focus over the next few days? And the focus today is going to be, in particular, the focus of not the prayer for divine love, but just prayer generally. Next week will be a focus on the prayer for divine love, and then there'll be a later in another session, prayer for divine truth. But today we're looking at the general characteristics of prayer. What kinds of things we can pray for, what kinds of things we will have difficulty praying for, and so forth. Does that make sense? So that's what we're focusing now. How our soul can communicate with God's soul, and we'll also talk about how God's soul responds. Now, firstly, I would like to mention what the effect of prayer is. The effect of prayer is that it opens up pathways in your soul. If you could think of your soul as a body for a moment. So, so you know how we've talked about you having a physical body and you have a spirit body and you have a soul? If you could think of your soul as another body... So, like, you have got a spirit body, a physical body, a spirit body, and a soul body, let's call it. All right? And if you can just picture that for a moment, that there's this third body that we haven't talked about as the soul being that body. In the spirit body, you know, that energy flows through it, doesn't it? And that's where you have your chakras. You've all heard of the term chakras, where you have energy meridians passing through your body. And these energy points are where energy flows through you. So you can think of emotions as energy in motion. So there's these feelings, if you like, that pass through you in your spirit form. Well, there's also feelings that pass through you. They all come, all these feelings come from your soul, and they pass through your soul. And if you can think of your soul as this great ball of energy through which emotion, and all energy in the soul is emotion, if you can think of all of this emotion flowing constantly in the soul, you can picture it in your mind like one of those, is it Van de Graaff balls, you know, where, they, where there's all this electrical energy flying off a ball, and that's your soul, that, that powerhouse of emotion, if you like, which is actually energy flowing out to the universe. When you begin to pray, there's a part of that soul that actually begins to open up. So this is where, when we're talking about true prayer that it actually opens up a portion of your soul. It, there's a physical part of your soul that begins to open up. And it's the part that opens up that's allowing you to receive. Allowing you to receive things from, in this particular case, from God. But from also all parts of God's universe. Prayer is the key, if you like, to opening up this part of your soul. So you know how most of the time when we think of prayer, you think of some religious sort of connotation of what prayer is. What I'm talking about actually is this part, this actual feeling or attitude in you, which is called prayer, that actually opens up a part of your soul so that you can now receive things that you couldn't before receive. Now, if it's a prayer for divine love, it will open up a part of your soul where you can start feeling and receiving divine love. But if it's a prayer for other things, you'll open up a part of your soul in each case that allows you to receive. The biggest issue that we have with our connection with God is we're constantly denying a connection with God. We're constantly pushing God away. We're constantly not receiving. That's now the default 
state of the human race, if you like. Does that How make sense? Sorry? How we constantly denying it. We'll talk about that in a minute, of how we're pushing God away rather than accepting. But one of the main ways is by not understanding prayer. You see, most of the time, if we talk about a religious connotation of prayer, most of the time it's thought of as a series of words that I read out, isn't it? So, our Father in Heaven might be one of those series of words. If we're another religion, there'll be another series of words that we read out, which is a prayer to God. But whatever the prayer is, a lot of times the way we view it is it's all coming from our intellect, really. How many times is our emotion involved in that process? So if you can remember what it was like when, say, some of you who went to church, how many times did your emotion get touched when you said the prayer? Compared to how many times you said the prayer without emotion. You, can you see how most of the time it's just the word coming out of our mouth or even a thought coming out of our brain, but in fact the soul is not touched. Can you see that? And if the soul isn't touched, then it's not a prayer. And that's the thing we need to understand. God is not hearing things from our mind. God is hearing things from our soul. Totally different place. Totally different space. So it, is, is the role of like a, a deep crisis on that hand gives us an avenue to access a bit more emotion? Yeah, that is one why, reason why deep crises always trigger connections with God generally. It's because when we're in a deep crisis, the soul is in these deep, really strong emotions and is often overwhelmed with powerful emotions. And because it's a crisis that we have no solution for generally, we then generate a longing for God to assist us in the crises, and that's what causes a connection in those particular states. So that's one reason why in a crisis we feel a connection with God when we may not feel a connection with God at other times. The whole object of prayer in the end, though, is to have a connection with God 24 by 7. So that's the whole object. We don't want to just connect with God in a crisis and then the rest of the time feel quite disconnected from God. What we want in the end is to have a direct relationship with God that's a constant relationship. Now, if you can think of it as a child would think of this. The, in the first century, when I began praying, I was only very, very young. So uh, I was around two years of age when I started to feel God. And I used to talk to God all the time. Like, I viewed God as uh, my daddy. And I used to often call God daddy um, or mummy. And I used to refer to God in that way because um, it, it felt like a very personal thing between me and God. And I also viewed God as my friend. So if you imagine you had a friend with you, 24 by 7, this friend loves you constantly, this friend is always interested in your welfare, this friend can also inform you about every single question that you have about anything in the universe that he created. Um, if you could establish a constant communication link with that friend, wouldn't that be such a benefit? to your life. Right. So you'd be able to find out, oh, I've got this ache in my body, what's that about? What, you know, so you, and you'd be talking away. And what, what used to happen for myself is I would be talking away out loud all the time until my father, Joseph, got quite upset with me about that. Or, um, and, and they thought I was somehow going crazy, and so I stopped talking out loud and started doing it just in my feelings and emotions. But before then, I used to speak out loud constantly. And there's nothing to stop you from doing the same. Just talking out loud, connecting to your own emotions constantly, and talking to your friend, God. If you could consider prayer as that, then you'll go far closer to what you could ever consider prayer to be in any other form. So the connection with God is like this childlike, innocent, chatting away to God. That's what we're really talking about. But the chatting has to be coming from the emotion. It can't just be coming from the mind. Everyone you follow that? As soon as it starts to come from the mind, then we're now out of the soul and we're now in an appendage of the soul. Remember, the spirit and material bodies that are connected to the soul, so the spirit body and the material body that are connected to the soul, 
are just appendages of the soul. You could think of them as an arm of the soul. You could think of the spirit body as one arm and the physical body another arm, if you like. So that's not the way through which you are going to connect to God by using these arms. What, how you're going to connect to God is by using your real self, which is the soul itself. That's how you will connect to God. And so every single thing that comes from you towards God as a prayer is going to need to somehow involve your emotions, your desires, your passions, your intentions, and so forth. And if it doesn't involve those things, then it's not a prayer. It is just intellectual words spoken to space. And there's a good quote in the pageant messages where he said, it rises no higher than the space above your head. <laughs> now, sure, thoughts certainly get transmitted all over the universe. So the truth is that every single thought you have is also a packet of energy, like an email, you can think of it as. So every thought you have in your mind is like an email, right? A packet of energy that is spread out in space. But every emotion you have is far more powerful. It's like it has a far more powerful effect on everything around you. The mind itself does have energy, and therefore every thought of the mind has some energy, but it has nowhere near the power that the energy of the soul has. So we can certainly use our mind to start connecting with our soul's emotion in when we pray. So I'm not saying don't do that. What I'm saying is understand that it's only when the emotion is involved that the prayer reaches God. And the way it works, it actually transmits, in a physical sense, it transmits faster than the speed of light. Well, when you think about it, if God is outside the universe, then God, that means that God must be further away than the farthest possible star we could ever measure. Now, at the moment... They've measured distances of what, two or three hundred or two or three million light years away. So if I had a feeling and it travelled at the speed of light, it would take two and a half million years before it reached God. It wouldn't be very effective, would it? No wonder I got the answer. No wonder I'm not getting it. Someone in two and a half million years' time's got to get my answer. Right? So obviously, prayer doesn't transmit at the speed of light. Tra prayer is transmitted, so, and this is the beauty of emotions. Emotions are instant transmissions. And that's one of the physical things that even those people in the sixth year do not understand. That every time you feel an emotion, it is instantly felt by everything in the universe. Now, if you have an emotion of feeling towards God, then God instantly feels that emotion. Now, if that emotion that you feel towards God is harmonious with God's love and harmonious with God's laws, God will have an emotional response. So if you could just imagine for a moment you've got a child sitting in your arms and the child starts crying. What do you feel straight away? You, don't you feel those tears straight away? You feel the sadness of that child straight away. And many of us would start trying to calm down the child, which obviously is not always the best thing to do. But there would be an instant emotional response in myself if I'm holding a child, particularly if the child has just been hurt or something, and you can feel the child's hurt. So if you can imagine now, God, she has you in her arms. And she has you in her arms constantly, whether you're aware of it or not, whether you're asleep to that or not. God has you in her arms. And every single emotion that you have, God actually can feel and sense. Every single emotion. Now, if those emotions are harmonious with love, God can respond to them. If those emotions are not harmonious with love, in other words, they are desires, passions, intentions, or emotions that are not loving in their intention, then God obviously can still sense them, but will probably, and obviously not, act upon them. But So God can feel your every emotion. Now, that raises a lot of issues, really, doesn't it, when you think about it? If God can feel my every emotion, then the emotion I had yesterday of killing somebody, well, God felt that. 
And the emotion I had last night of anger with my wife, well, God felt that too. And the emotion I had this morning of wanting to die, which was the one I had this morning, well, God felt that too. God felt every one of those. Now, every one of those that I just mentioned, God's not going to help me carry out. Because if I have an intention to die, for example, then God's emotion wouldn't... Like, God doesn't want me to die, does she? No. So, so therefore, God won't answer my desire to die. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, I'm feeling the emotion, but because the emotion is disharmonious with love, God can't respond to that emotion directly in the connection with me. God, however, can respond to the emotion if I allow the emotion to flow through me and I pray to God about healing the cause, then God can respond. And we'll talk about these principles of God responding and when God doesn't respond. But can you see that the, it's the emotional feeling? If you had a child in your arms, it's the feeling you're getting from them emotionally, isn't it, that you're responding to? It's not their words necessarily, although their words often are a response to their own emotion, and therefore their words often will trigger the emotion inside of you as well. And it's exactly the same in your connection with God. Exactly the same as that. When you have a feeling inside of you, and you voice that feeling in any way you possibly can, even if there is no words, but you feel the feeling, now God is feeling that feeling from you. And that's a prayer. <coughs> so that means, actually, that you can be praying to God while you're talking to another person. Doesn't it? Because you don't have to stop feeling an emotion towards God just because you're talking to someone else. Can you see how you can do both things concurrently? So you can actually get to a stage where you're praying constantly but not actually saying words. Would it be correct to say that your life becomes a prayer? Your li of course your life is a prayer. Yeah. But, um, but don't think it's just your life. Because it's also your emotions. Yeah. Like, so, so when we think of our life, generally we think of things happening to us from external, coming into us. But I'm saying it's in addition to that, it's also what you're actually feeling, which is being transmitted out to the world itself. So for many of you, you have a life that doesn't represent how you truly feel inside of you. Does it? Like how many of us really want to be in the job that we're in? So when you're in that job, doing that job, do you actually, are you feeling great about doing the job? Probably not. But God can feel that emotion from you, even though no one else around you might be able to sense that emotion from you. God senses all of your emotions as you have them. How can he survive? How can God survive? <laughs> well, God is so infinite in love that every single one of your emotions even if they are in the depths of despair, and a lot of humanity is in the depths of despair at the emotional level, that emotion God feels, but does not feel resonant with. Do you see the difference between being resonant with an emotion? Now, let me, let me illustrate. This soul, you can think of it like a tuning fork, if you like, that's vibrating at a certain frequency. When it has a feeling, it vibrates at a certain frequency. It's just like a soprano singer singing at a certain frequency. Now, there might be certain items in the room that vibrate at that same frequency and they resonate with that soprano singer. And it's the same with your soul. Your soul is vibrating constantly at a certain frequency and that is the sum total of your soul condition. And every single person around you will sense the bits of the frequency that also their soul vibrates at. And this is what causes a lot of attractions. Does that make sense? From a physical level. So here, my soul is vibrating at this certain frequency because of all the different emotions that I have in me at this moment. Your soul is vibrating at a different frequency with all the different emotions you have in you at a certain moment. But there are certain emotions that are the same in characteristics between the two of us. And we will feel resonant with each other. We will feel attracted to each other on those particular emotions. If you can think of God as being this huge assimilator of emotion, 
throughout the universe. Every, in fact, every living creature and even every inanimate object has a certain frequency and a certain emotion, and certain um, characteristics that God always feels. And your soul is the highest of those creations, and so your soul is the thing that he is most sensitive to. He's sensitive to absolutely every single child that he has ever, ever created. Every soul, God is just as sensitive to as every other soul. And that's why we can say that God is impartial, without partiality. Because your soul and my soul, from God's perspective, are identical in the sense that your soul and my soul, God can feel to the same intensities. It doesn't mean that your soul and my soul match each other in their emotions, or their desires, or their passions. But God can feel them. So God's there feeling and resonating with certain emotions that only God herself has. So if there's an emotion in me like, I want to die, and there's an emotion in God that God feels that life is supreme, then obviously my emotion and God's emotion are not harmonious, are they, in that state? So is God resonating with me at that point? No. And God can't <coughs> resonate with me at that point. God can feel the emotion in me, but God's soul will not resonate with me because my emotion is different to what God feels about me. When my soul begins resonating with God's soul on certain matters, that's when we start feeling the communication back from God. Does that make sense to everyone? No? We're both having the same kind of thing going on. So, for example, let's say my soul has a feeling of unworthiness in it. What does God feel about me? Or well, doesn't God feel that I'm supremely worthy? I'm, according to God, I am the pinnacle of his creation. As are you. But let's just refer it as one person. So if I'm feeling unworthy, God's feeling unworthy. Is my soul resonating with God's soul now? No. So if I then act or pray about something that is a result of my unworthiness, unless it's about healing it, I'm not dealing with the cause of my unworthiness. And of course, God's soul can't resonate with me about that. So all God can do then is, by, is direct other people around me in the way that God does, and we'll talk about this a bit later. God can direct other people around me to influence me, to help me see that actually I'm worthy. But God can't actually physically connect with me because I believe I'm not worthy. Does that make sense? And God feels I am worthy. So God is feeling my emotion, but not resonating with my emotion because my emotion doesn't agree with her emotion. And so God, under those circumstances, uses everything in her power outside of the physical connection she can have with me in order to influence me to see the truth. And the truth is that I am worthy. So there'll be all sorts of events, law of attraction events, law of cause and effect events, law of conversation events, and so forth, all that will occur to try and trigger me emotionally. There'll be people coming up to me. You'll hear different things about worthiness in my life, you know. And eventually, those things will get through to me. Whether it happens here on earth or it happens in the spirit world, eventually, it will get through to me. And when it gets through to me, my soul starts resonating with God's soul on the issue of whether I'm worthy or not. And I, in that state, now I can receive more from God. Because my soul agrees with God's soul about God's opinion of me. Does that make sense? So a lot of the times what we're doing is we're dealing with all of these issues where we are not actually feeling what God feels about us. So all disconnection between ourselves and God is caused by we ourselves not feeling what God feels about ourselves. That's what all disconnection is caused by. So what we're doing on this path of spiritual growth, the divine love path we've called it, which is the narrow way leading to life, what we're actually doing is we're learning to see ourselves as God sees us. That's what we're learning to do. And prayer is the major mechanism by which that will occur. Prayer is the only, in fact, mechanism by which your soul can receive divine love. So therefore, it's the only mechanism by which our changes can be made. 
Now, I'm not saying, though, that if, if God's soul doesn't resonate with our soul, that we're useless or hopeless, because we're not. Because God is constantly trying to, to connect with every one of his children through other means if they personally don't want to connect to God themselves. Does that make sense? So God is trying, even if you do not want a connection with God, God is trying as best she can with all the little laws involved and with your attitude and condition, your soul condition inside of your heart. God is doing exactly the best that she can already do to make this connection occur at some point in the future. All that has to happen at some point is for me to come to recognize that. And so quite often it's referred to in spiritual circles that we, we come to a process of awakening. And that's really, we could use that term if we want. We're awakening to the fact that actually it's only me that's keeping myself away from God. God is not distant from you. God is right with you right now. It's just that you can't always feel God with you right now. And that's the issue we face. The reason why we don't feel God is with us right now, if that's what we feel, is because we are not connecting to God in the sense of resonating with God about God's opinion of you. In other words, your own opinion of you is in disharmony with God's opinion of you. When your own opinion of you becomes, and when I use the term opinion, I'm talking about your emotional state, not just your intellectual state, your true emotional state, has the same opinion as God's opinion of you, now you will resonate with God. And in fact, at that point, when God's opinion of you and your opinion of you match each other perfectly, you also become at one with God. That is one of the characteristics of being at one with God. So everything before then is just learning to see what we are in terms of separating from God. And prayer is the key to finding out all that. And particularly the prayer for divine love is the key. Because if I'm not receiving divine love, it's because I am out of resonance. I am not in <coughs> harmony with something if I'm not receiving it. And I've got to allow myself, if I want to connect to God perfectly, I've got to at some point allow myself to actually notice that that's occurring and do something about it myself, because that's my free will. So at this stage, does everyone understand how God connects to us and how you connect to God? If you can just picture it emotionally rather than metaphysically. So the way I feel about it is like I'm the child and God's the parent and every single emotion I feel, whether I'm crying or laughing or whatever I'm feeling, I'm reflecting those emotions to God. Some of those emotions are going to be resonant with God's emotions about me and so we'll have a connection. Other ones of those emotions are not going to be the same as the emotions that God has about me and so there'll be a disconnection. But I can communicate all the time those emotions, can't I? Firstly, if I do that for myself, then I'll be connected to myself all the time, which is really, really great. That's one of the first things we need to do with regard to our connection with God. But then I will also notice when I'm not getting a response. And when I'm not getting a response, I'll know, oh, my opinion's not the same as God's opinion of me. The way I feel about myself isn't in harmony with what God's feeling about me on this particular subject, whatever that subject may be. So I'll know straight away that I'm in error. Can you see that? And if I know straight away I'm in error, <coughs> then I know what I need to fix, what I need to do, what I need to feel and work my way through in order to reconnect back with God again. So at this point, point, what we want to do is make sure that all of us understand that prayer is not an intellectual concept. Prayer isn't also some faith thing. Prayer is actually a physical connection between yourself and God through your soul, which is through your emotional condition, your soul condition. That's what prayer is. And it's a reality. 
And you can even start experimenting with it, even if you don't believe in God. You can actually experiment with prayer. And let yourself work through different issues with it. For example, you can say to God, well, I don't believe you exist. But if you exist, I don't believe you love either, actually, come to think of it. But if you do love, and if you exist, could you start showing me how to connect with your love? Uh, that could be just a prayer that we make. If we don't believe in God and we don't believe in love. And you will find over the coming weeks, things will change around you and you will start getting direction about those matters. Right? And this will happen to any single person, whether they believe in God or not, it will start happening to them. And eventually they will start having certain things happen. Because remember, it's the prayer that opens your soul. Remember I said it's the prayer that is the mechanism. You can think of it like your soul is a, as a bud, like a rose bud. And when you pray, you start the rose bud's really starting to open. Right? And when things start to open, that's when you can start receiving. Can you see that? There's a common illustration where, you know, if you hold your hands like that, right, are you ever going to receive anything? <laughs> You're not ever going to be out of it unless you open your hand to, to grab it, isn't it? And it's very much the same with your soul. Prayer is the mechanism by which you open your soul. It's very important we all understand that. And that's why prayer is so important. Because it's the mechanism by which our soul opens to be able to receive. So bearing that in mind, you notice... I've, so basically now I've covered this section, what true prayer does. So prayer is this emotional response to God, and it opens our soul to receive. It's a very, very powerful part. We've also talked about how God hears prayer, but there's a few things I'd like to mention about that. The way God designed our soul, and this is reflected in our chakras, by the way, in our spirit body, the way God designed our soul is that we have two facets of emotions. One facet of the emotions are the emotions we're about to have. And the other facet of our soul is the emotions we are currently experiencing. Can you see the difference between those two? So one is the set of emotions we were having right now, and then there are also a set of emotions that we're about to have. You could call them intentions. They are the emotions that are not yet flowing, but they're about to flow. God feels both things. So God not only feels the current set of emotions that you have, but God also feels the set of emotions you're about to have. And in fact, you will get to a point in your own development where you will also feel from other people not only the emotions they're currently having, but also the emotions they're about to have. You will in fact grow to get to that point. So for example, you'll grow to get to a point where you know that somebody's going to steal from you before they steal from you. For example. Or you know that somebody's going to want to uh, spend time with you before they even have the feeling they want to spend time with you. Because as your soul grows in its capacity to experience and as it receives divine love, your soul's qualities expands beyond, beyond what is the normal human soul and into having similar characteristics to God's soul. And one of these characteristics of God's soul is the ability to actually know what you're about to do, besides knowing what you're doing. So bearing that in mind, God can actually respond to prayer before you're actually feeling the prayer. So that's fairly powerful, isn't it, when you think about that? This is why many times there is lots and lots of spirits surrounding a person before a person makes a move or a shift emotionally. Because actually God is already responding to the fact that God knows that the person is going to make that shift. 
Okay. Um, page eight. Yeah, are the words important in the prayer? Because sometimes I, I'm trying to get the right words going, and then all of a sudden I think, oh, you understand what I'm talking about anyway, don't you? And it, um, words, what reason do I need? Words are important not for God, but they are important for you. The reason why they're important for you is because when you start speaking words most of the time, particularly, and this is before you reach the atonement condition, so I'm talking about this time from, you know, the first sphere, if you like, of your own progression to the, to the seventh sphere of your progression. During this phase of your progression, words can be quite important. The reason why they can be quite important, not for God, but for you, is that often certain words trigger certain emotions within you whereas other words don't. Certain situations trigger emotions in you, and when you speak the situation or speak the words, often the emotion then rises. So the beauty of words is they, they can help you, particularly in that phase before you're at one with God, to actually open up your soul so that you can feel the emotion that's actually there, and it's the emotion that is felt that God is hearing, if you like, if I use the term hearing. God's hearing the emotion. But God also, one of the key things that God wants you to do is for you to feel your own emotion before God responds to it. So the truth is that God will generally not respond to an emotion within you uh, that is just locked up and not felt by you. This is why God waits until you feel the emotion. Even though God knows that emotion is locked in you, God waits until you feel that emotion before God responds. Does that make sense to everyone? There's a reason why that is the case, or there's quite a lot of reasons actually why that is the case. One of the primary reasons is, if you're not aware of the issue within yourself, then how can you even receive something you're not aware of? Does that make sense? You firstly need an emotional awareness within yourself before you can receive something that is of the same resonance, if you like. So, for example, Many of you may have spent, like, when you were falling in love with someone, you might have spent quite a lot of time with him, you feel this draw to them, and, and if someone tells you, oh, you're in love with them, no, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm in love with them, right? But you still feel this draw, and you feel this draw towards them, and then one time, you'll just sit down, or maybe, and the, the penny will just drop, wow, I am in love with them, <laughs> right? <laughs> Up until that point, you really can't receive love from that other person, right? In that, in that I'm talking about now in a romantic sense. Um, because you have not the awareness within yourself that you even desired it. So even though other people could see you were desiring it, it was not until you were desiring it that you could feel your desire for it that actually things could flow properly. And this is very much the same with all of our interactions with other people, but also with God. God is constantly waiting for us to get to a state where we're aware of what we want. So we can't just do this thing that many people do, and that is, you know what I want, God, so please can I have that, whatever that is. <laughs> right? Can I just say a bit more about that? Because... If we do that, what are we doing? We're basically skipping over the fact that of our own awareness or our own unawareness. And God doesn't want us to do that. God wants us to be completely aware of everything that we desire, of everything we want, of everything we need. God wants us to be aware. Then God helps. Now, God does a lot of things to get us to that point of awareness. So the perfect prayer would actually be to be 100% humble all the time. Yes, when we're 100% humble all the time, what's happening is we're feeling our emotions all the time. So as we're feeling our emotions all the time, we are constantly praying. Now, some of those emotions, before we become at one with God, will be out of harmony with God, so they won't resonate with God, and we'll feel that. So we'll know that that emotion is out of harmony with but God. But it's still a prayer. But it's still a prayer, but we know that it's out of harmony with God because there's no response from God. So we know straight away that we're out of harmony and we know what to do, not to work on. And that's the beauty of being humble all the time, is when you're humble all the time, all these emotions are passing through you all the time. Some of them are going to be out of harmony with love. Some of them are going to be in harmony with love. The ones out of harmony with love will not feel the resonance from God. 
and then you'll know, oh, that's out of harmony with love. And then you can do something about it. You can pray about that emotion, for example, and do all of those kind of things. But we're not really 100% humble until we're actually at one with God either. Because up until that point, we're still not really feeling all of our emotions. So, so, so if I'm praying that um, I want what God wants for me, is that a, that's a cop out too? That's a cop out, yes. Yeah, what does God want for you? What you want for yourself in harmony with love. So what do you want for yourself? See, a lot of times our prayers avoid ourselves. We're constantly trying to avoid ourselves. Now, does God ever want you to avoid yourself? No, never. God never wants you to avoid what's inside of yourself. So any prayer that's about avoiding what's inside of yourself, God cannot respond to. He can hear it in the sense he feels your emotion. And he goes, oh, yeah, that's the emotion of him wanting to avoid again. <laughs> What can I do about that? Well, not much aside from tell, show him some truths about some other things about what he's avoiding and wait till he decides that he shouldn't avoid it anymore. That's all God can do in that circumstance. He can't physically tell you because you're in the space of not wanting to hear the truth, and that is that God actually wants you to know what you want. So it's very important. So can you see how God hears prayer, that section about God hears prayer? Does that make sense to you? What's going on with hearing prayer from God? So, if we understand that God is totally feeling and, and can sense all of your emotions, that God is not responding to all of your emotions, because the only emotions that God can respond to are the emotions that are harmonious with his laws. His, and his highest law, of course, is love. So, they are the emotions he can respond to in a direct sense. So I, I use that specifically. Please keep that in mind. In a direct sense. Because God can respond to all of the other emotions in an indirect sense. <clears throat> the way he responds to an indirect sense is, oh yes, I feel Ben has that emotion where he wants to avoid his own will. Right? So what can I do to help Sven? You imagine, if you can just imagine yourself, what would you do to help Sven when Sven's not listening to you? Send me <laughs> Wouldn't you go to that person and say, oh, that person knows about that law. I'll get that person to meet up with Sven sometime. And then I'll get that person to meet up with Sven sometime. And eventually Sven will get the message. Does that make sense? And so that's exactly what God does with us in each, in each case. So God is constantly answering our prayers, but not directly, often indirectly, because God can't answer them directly because of our own condition. So, so don't feel that God doesn't answer your prayers even if you're not hearing a direct response. Because God is actually knowing what you need. And so, for example, in that question that you asked, God's not going to say, no worries, here's my will for you. Go and do this, and go and do that, and go and do this for me, and then come back. God's not going to do that, right? But God's... So that... Your prayer can't be answered because God is never going to do that. But something God can do is help you see that actually at some point in the future you, you need to work what your own will is and bring that will in harmony with the laws of love and then you'll have a connection with God and now God can talk to you about that. Does that make sense to everyone what's going on? And this is something we need to come to understand about prayer. These are all parts about prayer. Now, I was going to read, I have, this is eight pages, it's nine pages, I don't know. There's a very, very good um, excerpt in the Life Elysian on page 228, it begins. Um, it, all of you, I think, have a CD, or most of you have a CD, that the Life Elysian is in the CD under the Divine Love section, under PDFs. Page 228, and it's actually written in the handout, and uh, rather than perhaps read it, which will possibly bore you, well it won't bore you, well, it doesn't bore me, but, but me reading might bore you, <laughs> and I'd like to just mention some of the things about it. In this example, there's this young boy who's just passed into the spirit world. His name is... Uh, Dandy, I think. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And Dandy lived on earth in a, in a situation where he had no parents to look after him. He was a street orphan. So he lived, when he was living on earth, he lived on the street. And the way that he would earn money was that he would have these little packets of matches that he would sell to passers-by. And that's how he would raise enough funds to buy enough food. There were many days where Dandy went without food. Dandy had an even younger orphan friend called uh, Bully Peg. Um, and Bully Peg also lived without food pretty much most of the time. And what they used to do is basically beg for food on the street. Now, there are many cities of the world right now today where this is happening constantly. Now, Dandy passed into the spirit world. There was an accident where he was asleep, and what happened was that he was asleep and this big box fell on him and squashed him. And within a few hours, he passed. Now, of course, he's very, very concerned about his friend, Bully Peck, who's still on earth, that he was looking after. So Danny was, so I think Danny was sort of in the late, sort of seven, six, seven, eight bracket, and Bully Peck, I think, was only five or so. So very, very young child. And what's happening is that uh, Dandy is enjoying his life in the spirit world, but he wants to go back and see how Bully Peg's doing. <clears throat> he goes back and sees Bully Peg not having eaten for a day. So he hasn't eaten for a day, hasn't had anything to eat, he's sleeping alone, hasn't had anything to eat. What would you feel if you're in that situation? Your friend on earth, you're in really comfort now, your friend on earth, is just in this state where, you know, they haven't had anything to eat, totally um, without anything to sustain them. Living on the streets, sleeping in cardboard boxes, five years of age. What would you feel? Uh, you want to help. Well, the first thing Dandy felt was anger to God, anger towards God. And this was where his prayer began. He didn't actually physically say to God, I'm angry with you. What he did was he got to his other mates in the spirit world and he said, what's going on? <laughs> what's going on? This isn't fair. God should have taken me and, sorry, taken Bully Peg and left me on earth because I could look after myself, but Bully Peg couldn't. Why didn't God do that? Fair enough question, right? That's the way he viewed it. Now, he went to another person called Afra, who'd been in the spirit world for a while, and, uh, and Afra couldn't answer the question uh, because Afra didn't know why God had chosen, uh, seemingly chosen Dandy and left Bully Peg there without any sustenance. But what actually happened was that Dandy's feelings directed about God at this particular instant automatically drew a response from God. And one of the celestial spirits was sent to actually make sure that not only that Bully Peg got a meal, but eventually that Bully Peg actually was adopted by somebody. Just because of the prayer of this young boy in the spirit world. Now, what does that demonstrate about prayer? Well, firstly... It demonstrates that our emotions are the key and our desires are the key to prayer. But they have to be desires based around truth and honesty. So if, if Danny just looked at Bully Peg and said, oh, yeah, no worries, that's happening on earth, there's nothing I can do about it, which is probably something he might have felt because he, he was a spirit now. Nothing I can do about it. I've just got to accept it. Right? He didn't have those emotions. The emotions that he actually had was, I am angry with God about this. This isn't fair. Right? So let's look at that with your relationship with God. If you're angry with God and you're faking that you're not angry with God, does God hear you? If you're angry with God and you're actually living in the angry with God, you're actually feeling that anger with God and expressing it to God, now is God hearing you? Can you see the difference? 
One of those states, see, see, the earth would, the world would tell you that the first state is harmonious with God's love. In other words, the first state where you, you suppress your anger with God is harmonious with God's love. But the truth is totally the opposite. God's love doesn't lie, and therefore you, if you're lying to yourself or to God, are out of harmony with God's love. Does that make sense? What God wants from you too is your emotion. That's the har that's bringing you in harmony with God's love. There was another example I know of of a man who called in a priest. There was a man dying of cancer, and uh, he knew he was going to die very soon. And he he went through, you know, obviously as many people do, we go through this process of you know looking for cures and so forth. And when all that exhausts itself. Usually, we skip into a place where we're quite upset and angry. And so for a whole night, he spent abusing and swearing at God. He was a religious man, and so the next morning, he felt so bad about abusing and swearing at God all night that he called in a minister and, uh, and said, well, you know, now I'm not going to make the heaven, am I? You know, because I've been swearing and abusing at God all night, right? So, you know, I've just lowered my chances of uh, reaching, you know, the heavens. But in reality, the minister said a good thing to him. He said that, well, actually, you've been praying. Yeah. And you see, pray, prayer is like that. Prayer is going to be exactly your feelings. Exactly your feelings. Can you see, every time you manufacture thoughts not based on your feelings, you're no longer praying. It's exactly your feelings transmitted to God that's your prayer. So your emotions are essential. And your emotions being harmonious with truth are essential. Yes? Um, hey, Jay, just back to the dandy story. Yep. Just briefly, why wouldn't God have enough compassion to provide food and a parent for the boy pig without dandy's emotion? God was already trying to do that with the resources available. But the additional prayer causes another response, not only in God, but also in the universe around us. And what that does is it starts activating the souls of others automatically. And God does this automatically as well, starts activating the souls of others. So, so what happened in this particular instance is the soul of a man who lived in London at the time, was activated to go and visit that particular location. In other words, intuition was a way that God, God interacts with everyone. You see, the problem is that most of us don't follow intuition. Like, you know, we're busy and we have a certain lifestyle or whatever and we're doing certain things and we, you know, we have a certain feeling to do something and we just go, oh, no, no, no I won't do that, you know, and we just forget about it. But every one of those intuitions comes from external sources, from God, generally. The truth is that God sense. wants every child to be parented. Mm -hmm. However, why would a person on earth be five years of age and be in a state where they have no food? Parents. What causes that? Parents. Not just parents. 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 Society. Right? So God can't take away the effects of those things. All God can do is motivate other people to take away the effects of those things. Do you understand? For God to take away the effects of those things would mean that God would have broken one of their own laws. So what God does instead is he, God appeals to other people who are willing to take away the effects of those things in order for these, these things to disappear. So that's one way how God answers prayer. Right? The truth is that all, all of us, if all of us got to the state where we're at harmony with God, there would not be a single person on earth who was without food ever, or without a parent ever. But th that's not the reality of what things are because of men walking away from God. So the key thing to remember is that God is trying, is trying to help every single one of her children, but within the constraints of God's own laws. See, if God broke her own law, then... You, know, you can see straight away there's going to be lots of problems because now there's going to be anarchy. Like, and nothing God does is anarchy, is anarchy. Also, can you see if God breaks her own law, then she's no longer God. Right? Why would you establish a law that's not perfect? 
So, in fact, God will never, ever break her own laws, but she will often motivate others in the constraint of her laws to act in harmony with love, which is what happened in this particular circumstance. Does that make sense? Mary? Isn't that why prayer is so powerful? Because actually, um, God really wants us to bring our will in line with her love. Yes. So, what Danny did, was demonstrated that his will was in line with God's love and so then God could act exactly. before that because no one else had demonstrated that will apart from Daddy when he was on earth. Yep. Then God couldn't act. Exactly. Yep. So God was there bringing, like waiting for somebody to bring themselves into harmony with her love and then God can act. And God can then motivate that person who's now in harmony with God's love to do many things harmonious with God's love. But it's a, that's the thing God is always waiting for with all of us. Now eventually God will get to the point where God will not need to do many of those things in a roundabout way because all of us will be connected to God and are one with God and God can operate directly through us. So the state that I was in in the first century was that state where God could operate directly through me to deal with issues rather than having to work around in a certain, what is the word, circuitous, circuitous. circuitous manner, which is obviously difficult, but not beyond God's capacity. So the other thing that was required by Dandy as well was this feeling of sincerity. Um, you see, we often pray for things, or think we're praying for things, but we're not really sincere about it. For example, many of you have been praying to connect with your emotions. Would that not be the case? Like many of you feel you've been praying to connect to your emotions. The truth is that many of you are not sincere about it. <laughs> now, why would you not be sincere about it? Well, because you might be afraid of your emotions, right? So, how can I at one moment be afraid of my emotions and then pray to feel my emotions? Wouldn't it be better for me, if I was living in truth, wouldn't it be better for me to actually pray about the fear I have about dealing with my emotions? Can you see that? <coughs> you see, if I'm praying about feeling my emotions and the feeling I have inside of me is I don't want to feel my emotions, my emotions are scary, they're going to terrify me, I, you know, everything's going to go haywire when I feel my emotions in my life, everything's going to be terrible, I don't want to do that. That's, that's the feeling in me because of fears. And yet I'm saying to God, oh, please help me feel my emotions. Is my prayer sincere? No. It's not sincere. Right? It's only going to become sincere when I actually say, well, actually, God, I don't want to feel my emotions. You know, I don't think it's very good that you made this system where I've got to feel my emotions. <laughs> well, actually, now that I think about it, I like the idea of feeling my good emotions, but not my bad emotions, right? So it would be far better talking to God like this, wouldn't it? So... I'm happy to feel my good emotions, but I don't want to feel my bad emotions. And then you'll think, oh, hang a sec, I'm never going to get one with you like that. Um, so, all right, um, all right, uh, I don't want to feel my good emotions still, but can you show me all the reasons why I don't want to feel my good emotions? And then we come to an awareness of all the reasons why we don't want to feel our good emotions. And as we become to an awareness of those things, we feel the blockages to feeling our emotion. And, uh, and once those drop away, those beliefs, those false beliefs that are within us drop away, now we can say, I want to feel my emotions. And you know what? The moment we get to, I want to feel my emotions, you're going to really start feeling your emotions. Right? Because you have released the reasons why you didn't want to. Now, the issue with prayer is this. I can pray to God about feeling my emotions till the cows come home, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day as well, and until I die, and I can never feel an emotion, unless I actually deal with the issue of why I don't want it. Does that make sense? Because what is God waiting for you? God is waiting for you to be truthful with yourself. Right? I don't want to feel my emotions. That's the truth. If I'm not feeling my emotion right now, I don't want to feel it. That's the truth. So deal with that truth and start talking about that truth. Does that make sense? 
If you don't do that, you're not being sincere. You might be all emotional and everything, say, oh, I've got a terrible life, you know, and, and crying about all these things, but until you actually are sincere, God cannot answer the prayer. Can you see why? Because what we're doing is we're creating a false sense of belief within ourselves still. And it's until we actually state the truth of what's going on within ourselves that we'll connect to God. That's when we connect to God, when we're in that state of truth and sincerity. We can also have a lack of earnestness about connecting to God. So, for example, we can say, yeah, I want to connect to my emotions, no worries. And then today I do all of these different things, I'm busy up my life, and the next day I busy up my life, and a week's gone past and I have another prayer to go, oh, yeah, I think I want to do it with my emotions. And then, you know, we have this and that happen in our lives. Now, does that sound very uh, earnest to you? <laughs> what do you think it's going to sound earnest to God? Right. And this is why in times of crises often there is that earnestness that arises within us because we want things to fix in those times generally straight away, right? And so then we're more open to, to truth and therefore more be able to be influenced by God. But if we continue to think that we can have a lukewarm attitude to dealing with things, we are way out of harmony with love because love ain't lukewarm. No. Love is passionate, hot thing, right? No. It doesn't wait for you. It doesn't wait for anything. Love doesn't. Love is an instant desire. Does that make sense? Is earnestness the same as impatience? No. Impatience is actually driven by an emotion of anger, whereas earnestness is having a really sincere, earnest desire to make something happen, putting your whole into it. Right? So totally different qualities, yeah. So we're not impatient for God, but we're earnest for God. Well, well whatever, the, whatever the prayer is about, we're earnest about. For example, many of you know now that you need to be in harmony with personal truth, and you need to be in harmony with truth to connect to God, right? But many of you have not yet made the shift into telling the truth every single moment and every single time in your life when an issue comes up. So if I pray to God, please, I want more of your love to become at one with you. And right at the same time, I'm making the choice to not be truthful with every interaction around me. Can my prayer be answered? Obviously not. So we need to start to see, too, that every time we have a prayer, if we're really earnest about it, we will start putting things into action ourselves. And that putting things into action will actually cause huge shifts within our own soul, but also cause us to maintain a connection with God. We need to get into that place where we're totally, 100% honest and truthful about everything and with everyone in our life. No matter what the result is going to be. So, let's say I had in the past stolen money from my employer. He never found out about it. I'm still employed. And this is something that I know right now. This is something that's happened to me right now, let's say. As soon as I made this shift into truth, what would I do? Wouldn't I go to him and say, look, like five years ago, I stole, you know, a hundred bucks out of the till. And would, if you were really sorry about it, if you were really repentant about it, you'd probably give him the hundred bucks back, wouldn't you? With interest, probably. <laughs> uh, after five years, it might be now 200 bucks if you have to give back. So you'd give him back that, and you would take whatever the results of your actions would be. So if he decided, I can't trust you anymore, I'm sacking you. If he decided that, then you would have to go along with that. Does that make sense? Because that would be an act of truth. That's, that's what I mean by staying in truth. Even if you know the results of you telling the truth are going to be what you believe to be negative. At some point when you come to this appreciation of how important truth is, you will still do it. Now, if I'm praying to God, please show me your truth, 
And yet I know this thing has happened to me in my past and it keeps popping in my mind occasionally, you know, like, you know, things that we're guilty about often have a habit of doing that, don't they? Oh, you know, pop into my mind again. Don't let them pop out of your mind again. Do something about it. Let yourself feel it. Now, if you're praying to God for truth and now you're acting in truth, can you see that God can respond to that? But if you're praying to God for truth and you're acting falsely, how can God respond to that? Like, God's going to have to wait. God's going to have to move some other of the people in the universe around who want to listen to God's desires and will and to get you to a state where you actually can see what you're doing. Now, this is happening a lot in the divine love movement today. You know, many of you probably in your own investigations of things that I've been telling you have probably done searches on the internet and you've found 20 different sites all of, on the divine love stuff, all related to the pageant messages and so forth. And they all have their own different, uh, I suppose you could say their own different communities. Many of them totally get rid of anybody else in the divine love path if they disappoint them. Now, is that love? No. Like, is it love to actually totally banish a person just for the sake of a disagreement? It's not love, is it? Now, it is love if the person, if the person is harming you or attempting to harm you to actually say, well, I can't be with you or speak with you until you stop harming me. But let's define harm. Harm has to be God's perspective of harm, not your own. Does that make sense? So if harm happens to you to be, oh, he told the truth about me on the net, you know, that's not harm from God's perspective. Can you see the difference? Now, the problem is for many of, many of these things happening within the divine love movement is that everyone says they have divine love, but if you have divine love, wouldn't you have love with each other? Wouldn't you also have truth with each other? And would you ever say to somebody, oh, you're banned forever from my life? No. So if those things are happening, what's, got, what, what's going on? Obviously not love. Something else is going on, right? So when you analyse things in your life, and you analyse the people that you're with, and you feel things about things going on external to yourself, Ask yourself the question, was that loving? And if it wasn't loving, why aren't you addressing it? So address it with these people. So if you notice on a forum somewhere that someone wasn't loving someone, say that. Stick your nose in and say it. Do you know what I mean? And if you get banned, well, obviously there's another proof that the person's not loving. But let that happen. Do you know what I mean? Allow yourself to work through these issues of why you don't stick up for truth and stick up for love. Now, what will eventually happen is all of these different uh, divine love movements, if we put them in quotation marks, because very few of them are divine love movements. They're actually just <coughs> verbal, intellectual movements about divine love. The truth is, the divine love movement, the real one on earth, the one that's growing, the only one, in fact, that's growing, is the one that's going to be connected to God and emotions. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's the only one that will eventually grow. All the others will not grow. I have actually, just lately, because you're just saying that I was the one who was investigating lots and lots of them, and I have read through all of them, I take it in evening, and I have not found in any of those movements anyone is dealing with their emotions at all. Exactly. They all pray and claim that they get divine love in pockets. Yeah. But nobody is really talking. And you address it with them and you'll find they'll get angry with you, get upset with you. I'm already banned. Yeah, but yeah, you get banned. <laughs> you get banned straight away. And if you if, if you say anything about AJ, you'll definitely get banned. I don't have to. I was only speaking about emotions. About emotions. Exactly. But do you actually deal with your emotions? And they said, we've, we've done that, like, way back. Yeah. And then when you say, no, you haven't, because you've got this emotion and that emotion, then they get upset and yeah. ban Yeah. So what's going on there? They are praying for divine love to enter them, but are they receiving divine love? No, they cannot be receiving divine love while they're in a state of untruth, emotionally. It's quite simple. And you can see when a person's not doing it, because they get angry with you when you tell them they're not doing it. <laughs> 
<laughs> Does that make sense? Would, like, if you were receiving divine love and you'd received divine love and you knew it was happening and I told you it's not happening for you, would you get angry with me? No, because you'd be in a state of divine love where that wouldn't matter what I thought to you. Does that make sense? But if you get angry with me, obviously, the anger is covering over what? Deeper emotions that are not loving. So loving, anger is not a loving emotion, is it? So obviously, no reflection of love. So the key thing to bear in mind with all of these things that happens externally even, is if I'm not willing to stay in a state of truth and love myself, and then I'm praying to God to receive love, can I expect to continue to receive love constantly in that state? Obviously not. I can't expect to do that. I have to actually do something inside of myself and shift something inside of myself before I will begin receiving divine love again. The other attitude that uh, Dandy had in this illustration I gave earlier was the attitude of thankfulness. You see, after Dandy saw Bully Peg firstly get a big meal, and then this man who gave Bully Peg a big meal arranged for a family to take care of, of, uh, of Bully Peg. When Dandy saw that, what, if you saw that, how would you feel? You'd just be so overwhelmed, wouldn't you? Like, wow, like all I asked for was a meal, and he got a home as well as a meal, right? Wouldn't you just feel that deep, overwhelming thankfulness? And that's another part of our prayers to God. It's so important for us to, to, to look at this issue of thankfulness. You see, a lot of times we're not actually thankful. See, many times you see people sitting down for a meal, right? They pray to God, thank you for the meal, and then they argue in the table right, with the person who made the meal. Now, is that thankful? Obviously not. So deal with that. You need to deal with that emotionally. Oftentimes what happens with us we, is we receive things without notice. We don't notice what we're receiving. And one thing, one thing that God wants us to do is to become very aware of what we have received. And when, when we're like a child, you will feel a deep <coughs> awareness of everything you've received that has been good in your life. And you'll feel a deep feeling of thankfulness to God about that. So thankfulness and gratitude is so important in your own progression. Thank God for what God has already done for you. For many of you, you many of you have this resonant feeling in your hearts that that you're learning truth when you come along to these sessions. I know that many of you have spoken to me and said that for the first time in your life you've felt like the truth and you've been many of you have been searching for truth for years and years and years. Have you thanked God for that? You see? Just, because that, that's all, God, God rewarded your seeking, but are we thankful for God for that? And often when we're thankful, or we say we're thankful, we don't act thankful. So, for example, if you receive a truth, and you know it to be a truth in your heart, but you don't act upon that truth in your life, are you really thankful? What do you think? If you know it's the truth in your heart, and you don't act upon the truth in your life, are you thankful for receiving that truth? Obviously not. Can you see? Wouldn't you then need to look at that emotionally? What's going on inside of me emotionally that would cause me to think that I'm thankful? I know it's the truth that I just heard, and yet I haven't acted upon it. What inside of me would cause me to do that? Wouldn't, wouldn't it be part of thankfulness to analyse that, to look at myself with that, and ask myself why I haven't acted upon that truth? So, you see, it's one thing to say thank you, Quite another thing to actually be thankful. Carol? Ajay, do you think it's possible to use gratefulness as a tool to suppress your emotions? Definitely, yes. <coughs> so called spirit of thankfulness can be used, like, and the truth is, we can use lots of things to suppress our emotions. But one way we can use so called gratefulness to suppress our emotions is to say, oh, I'm so grateful for the life my family gave to me when I was growing up, and then because I'm so grateful, 
I don't want to look at the fact that mum, you know, dad abused mum and mum, mum had a had a you know an affair and then my younger brother did this. You know, and I don't want to look at all the things going on emotionally that affected me. So quite often we use excuses to not analyse our emotions. Now we need to remember that God understands our soul, so God knows when we're doing this. God knows when we're using even something like thankfulness, in quotation marks now, in an unreal state. And you see, this is why it's so important to never deceive yourself with your own emotion. And you notice, like next month, I've got to talk about that now. Like, I'm doing a talk next month, it's called Emotions of Self-Deception. The reason why is because oftentimes we prevent our truthful state of being by having a whole group of emotions of self-deception, many of which look on the outside to be good and loving, but actually on the inside are full, full of, as I said in the first century, dead men's bones, you know, like full of smelly things that we don't want to smell or look at. Right? And that's what we often do in our, in our lives now. We often use things that on the outside look good, but on the inside, we're actually using them to run away from ourselves. So God sees that. God sees us as we truly are. Many of you who have already began your emotional work have become quite shocked sometimes at what you've seen within yourself. Have you felt that? Like, when you started to actually look, you think, oh no, what have I been, you know, gee, what, you know, things even that you thought were quite good about yourself, right? And then you see your motive for doing it, and oh, wow, your motive's like, I needed something from them, or I used them for sex, or I did this for something else, you know? Like, a lot of times there's this bartering system going on inside of us, and we start becoming aware of it. Well, that's part of truthfulness we've got. You see, God wants you to become truthful with yourself and with God about those things. If you're not truthful with yourself and God about those things, then God's love eventually can't flow into you. So you'll receive a bit of love until such time as the truth is always being compromised and then you'll receive no more. Can you see that? Or you'll receive a bit of love until you're no longer sincere about dealing with something and then you'll receive no more. Or you'll receive a bit of love until you're no longer earnest, until you no longer have a sincere desire. Right? And then you'll receive no more. And this is why a lot of people on the Divine Love Path, when they first find the path, they read sometimes the pageant messages or whatever, they feel a soul connection with what's going on, and they feel the inflow of Divine Love, and then it stops. And then for the next 25 years, it never starts again. And there's many people on the earth in that condition. <coughs> the reason why they're not continuing to receive is because their prayers are not sincere, they're not honest, they're not truthful, they're not open, they're not thankful, they're not earnest. And it's the prayers that need to be sorted out. And when they sort out their prayer, change will come within. And things will happen around it automatically. Now, you notice that I've included all those things I've just mentioned under that section, essential elements of prayer. So, if there's anything you take home from this discussion about prayer, try to take home those essential elements of prayer and utilise those essential elements in your life with regard to prayer. What I've done after that is I've tried to be a bit more specific about what kinds of prayers, or the content of prayer. And this is why I've got content, what will be heard by God, and then I've got another section, content, what won't be heard by God. And what we'll do is, we'll, we might not go through all of these today, but they're there for your, for your appraisal, and you can look through them at your own time. But there are some that I would like to cover with you in a lot of detail. The reason why is the majority of people have trouble with some of these points with regard to prayer. The first one is prayer about causes rather than effects rather than causes. I'd just like to read you a pageant message. This was written by a friend of mine. Many of you would have heard of Elijah. And Elias is his name in the spirit world. And he was a prophet, a so-called prophet, very early times in Israel's history. 
and he was around on earth around 1800 years before I arrived on the earth. And I eventually uh, got to meet him when I passed because he was one of my guides. So Eli was one of my guides in the first century. But this is what he said to Paget: I am here, Elias the prophet of old. I will write a short message tonight as it's late and you are tired. Well, I desire to say that the message you received from the Master contains some of the most important truths affecting the relationship of God to man in his worldly or material living. Every truth that was uttered has in it an element which shows that man, to a certain extent, must expect and know that God will not interfere with the law of compensation as to its effects and results. Only will he help man to remove the causes that so certainly entail the results. And the sooner men know this and more thoroughly understand it, they will become able to avoid the consequences of sin and the violation of law, and also understand that no prayer will cause God to respond where a suspension or a setting aside of his laws or their workings are necessary. He will respond to prayer where that prayer asks for the removal of causes but never when it applies only to effects. This truth men should learn and in their prayers ask for those things or causes which in compliance with the law of compensation bring about results that are harmful for them to be removed or eliminated from their acts and deeds as well as from their desires. I could write a long message on this subject but I won't do so now as you're just not in the condition to receive it. <laughs> I'll come soon and write at length and so with my love I'll say good night, your brother in Christ, Elias. Now Paget was never in the condition after that to actually receive a longer message on that subject. Um, and it's probably that subject that I'd like to spend a bit of time on now. And that is the subject that God does not listen to prayers that address effects. Effects. So God does not listen to the prayers that address effects. And I'll explain what I mean by effects. He only listens to prayers that address causes. Now, let's look at how man works. Let's look at all of man's laws generally. Like, for example, the law of speeding. You know, you exceed 100 k's along the highway. You get, you know, if it's 107 k's or 115 k's or 121, you get a different fine as you go up. And eventually, what is it, a 150 or 60 k's of suspension of license, removed, whatever. All of that is just dealing with an effect. Can you see why? You're not dealing with the cause of why a person speeds. You're only dealing with the fact that they have sped. None of God's laws are like that. All of God's laws address the causes of what we do rather than the effects. Now, that being the case, if we pray about an effect being removed from something that we've done in our life and we don't want to address the cause... God cannot assist us. Big, a big example with this is many people when they get an incurable, if I put that in quotation marks, disease, they will often pray to God about the removal of the disease. But what are they praying about? They're paying the re for the removal of the effect. Can God answer that prayer? No. No. But God can answer a prayer where I pray for the removal of the cause within me and to do to be removed, it's going to have to be felt by me, isn't it? The removal or the experience of the cause within me that causes me to have this incurable disease. Now God can answer that prayer. God can answer that prayer directly. Can you see the difference? The reason why God never answers a prayer that deals with effects is really quite simple. If God takes away the effect, he is actually breaking one of his own laws. In fact, not only just one of his own laws, there are quite a lot of laws he's breaking of his own if he takes away the effect. There actually is actually a law of cause and effect. There is also a law of compensation. Or you could think of it as karma, what you sow, you will reap. 
Now, those laws have been put into place specifically to correct us. For example, if you had a young child and you told the child that the stove was hot, but the child didn't have a physiological response in their body where if they put their finger on the stove, they felt a sensation of burning, what would happen to that child if it put its finger on the stove? It would just lay its finger on the stove and eventually the finger would smolder and smolder, then burn and smell the smell of burning flesh and eventually the finger would burn away, wouldn't it? And yet that child would not feel any effect. Now God doesn't do that. God always wants you to feel the effect of something that is happening to you. Always. But what he wants is for you to address the cause. Right? And when you address the causes, and you pray about causes, God can answer those prayers. So, I've given some examples in the outline. If you look at uh, page... Uh, two, yep. You see this a lot where... Parents sometimes become so embroiled in children's emotions. Like, like, often parents are so distressed by their children's emotions, they spend a lot of time praying to God about their ch child changing their behaviour. That is a total skipping over of the fact that the parent is creating the child's behaviour. So therefore, it is an effect. Can God change that or help that situation? No, not until you realise that actually the effect, which is your child's behaviour, has a cause inside of you that you're suppressing. Does that make sense? When you connect with the fact that it has a cause with inside you that you're suppressing and you pray about that, now God can help you. And you'll find help very rapidly in most cases under these circumstances. And within a few <coughs> moments even sometimes, the child no longer has that effect. 